All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to our seminar series, Information Theory in Singapore ITIS. All right. This is our second talk in 2021, and my name is Han Mao. And welcome back to Virtual Singapore. Okay, so as uh, we have seen last week, and for those who are new here, okay, what you see behind me is Singapore's Changi Airport, okay, uh, which is rather quiet during these unusual times. I hope these strange times will pass soon, and uh, for those of you who are not in Singapore, I hope you can visit us in person sometime soon. So for those who are joining us for the first time, the Information Theory in Singapore ITIS Seminar Series is organized by a team that includes Mehu Motani from uh, National University of Singapore, Kui Chai and Tuan Teng Yuan from SUTD, the Singapore University of Technology and Design, and me, uh, Han Mao Kia from Nanyang Technological University. Our aim is to promote, advocate, and spread the joy of coding theory and information theory within Singapore and around the world. Okay, so we have five, talk, five talks lined up for these two months, uh, February and March, and today is the second talk. Now, before we get things going, uh, let me address a few logistical matters. Please keep your microphone and video muted for the duration of the talk. If you have questions, you can post them in the chat group chat and we'll keep a lookout for it. We'll also um, we'll address the questions in the Q&A session at the end of the talk. And with that, it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Ogitsa Milankovic as our speaker. Let me get someone in. Okay, now, uh, Ogisa Milankovic is a professor of electrical and computer engineering at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, UIUC, and research professor at the Coordinated Science Lab. Professor Milankovic heads a group focused on addressing unique interdisciplinary research challenges spanning the areas of algorithm design and computing, bioinformatics, coding theory, machine learning, and signal processing. A scholar her scholarly contributions have been recognized by multiple awards, including the NSF Early Faculty Early Career Award, Development Award, the DAPA Young Faculty Award, the Dean's Excellence in Research Award, and several Best Paper Awards. In 2013, she was elected a UIUC Center for Advanced Study Associate and Willard Scholar, and in 2015, she was elected Distinguished Lecturer of the Information Theory Society. In 2018, she became an IEEE Fellow and she has served as Associate Editor of the IEEE Transactions on Communications, the IEEE Transactions on Signal Processing, the IEEE Transactions on Information Theory, and the IEEE Transactions on Molecular, Biological, and Multi-Scale Communications. In, 20, in 2009, she was the Chief Guest Editor-in-Chief of a special issue of the IEEE Transactions on Information Theory on Molecular, Biology, and neuroscience. And on a more personal note, okay, Ogisa has been a kind and generous mentor to me and many young researchers in our area. When I joined her group in 2014, I was impressed not by not only by her breadth of knowledge, but also her depth. She was always able to find interesting and sophisticated tools from one area and apply it to another and obtain amazing results. Today's talk will be one of many, many examples. And the title of her talk is DNA Punch Cards, Implementations and Coding Theoretical Questions. Professor Milankovic, please. Thank you so much, Han Mao. Uh, that was a wonderful introduction, especially the last two, three lines. And uh, I'm so glad you were in my group. And I have to say, I'm really glad that you're not here now because we are freezing <laughs> below zero <laughs> for three weeks. So, uh, and uh, it's a great pleasure to be uh, with you today. And uh, uh, as Han Mao mentioned, I've been trying to find some interesting topics to work on. I guess you can do it once you get a bit older. And biology is, uh, for me at least, an amazing source of inspiration. And the talk today, which is entitled DNA Punch Cards, will give you a very gentle introduction to uh, a new form of DNA storage systems. And this is something we just published uh, last year in 2020. And I hope uh, to spend most of the time really talking about the bio. I hope it's not going to be uh, uh, an impediment for your understanding and following the so topic material. And the reason why I'm planning to do that is so that you can see how interesting coding theoretic questions really arise when you study biology. You get a natural set of new problems that you would never uh, have thought of 
if it were for the bio uh, component of it. So let me start and explain to you what these DNA punch cards are. And I'm going to go very slowly and hopefully if there are questions, we can uh, address them either, either throughout the talk or at the end of the talk. So um, the uh, uh, DNA punch card system is uh, really uh, a new storage system that uses DNA as the storage media. And everything in this talk is motivated by this molecule that we call DNA. And before I start describing how we are going to use DNA as a storage system, let me really give you a very brief introduction regarding the structure of the molecule. So you all heard about the so-called double helix structure of DNA. So what you have in the double helix structure is the so-called sugar phosphate backbone. So you see two sugar phosphate backbones. You see P, which stands for phosphate, the phosphate group. S stands for a sugar. And they're um, boring backbones because um, you have an alternate, alternating phosphate and sugar group. So you see PS, PS on both sides of the double helix. And what is the interesting component of this molecule are the so-called bases. And for the purpose of this talk, you only need to know that there are four types of bases there. And we are for simplicity going to call them A, T, G, and C. And these bases are attached to the sugar molecules and then they form bonds between each other that hold the double helix structure in place. And what is known as the Watson Creek binding principle as, um, uh, asserts that uh, with very, very high probability in a normal DNA double helix construct, you will see A and T bind together. So if A is protruding from one part of the sugar on the right-hand side, like in this example, T will be on the other side and vice versa, like in this example here. And then if you have G, it's always paired up with C and vice versa. And the Strength of the pairing is designated by these dashed lines, G and C bond stronger than A and T. But what the really interesting uh, uh, composition or structural form of the DNA is, is this uh, pairing of the bases in uh, the middle of this picture. So the symbols A and T are deterministically paired, but they are symbols from a four letter alphabet, which made a lot of people think in the past that maybe since we call this the genetic code, this could be used as a code for something completely different rather than storing uh, information about the blueprint of organisms. So a, 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 a triple of a phosphate sugar and a base form a nucleotide, but usually when someone uses the word nucleotide, the references is usually to the base that is involved in this um, uh, triple. So, and uh, I forgot to mention, we also have the two strands and I will often refer to the two different strands as sense and anti-sense strands. So they are just the two different strands of the uh, or sugar phosphate backbone uh, parts. So what is exceptionally interesting is that uh, a pair of nucleotides of DNA. So basically, if you look at this portion here, has a mass that is 650 Daltons. And a Dalton is roughly 10 to the minus 24 grams. So we are talking about an incredibly light and uh, a lightweight construct. And uh, the whole mass of a human genome is roughly 10 to the minus 12 grams. And the spacing between uh, two bases is of the order of a nanometer. It's actually zero point, roughly 0 0.3 nanometers. So this is a tiny molecule that can uh, basically stack up these symbols that we call bases with an incredible density. So as a result, it's not really surprising to observe that uh, in addition, given that uh, the media is very durable, we know that DNA can survive for hundreds and thousands of years, that there are many architectures available for reading DNA, not for any other reason, except that we've been obsessing with biological research and nowadays personal medicine and genetic information is used in all forms of uh, medical research. We have all these um, incredible devices like next generation sequencing devices or third generation sequencing devices that allow us to read the actual composition or a string of ATGCs that are attached to the sugar phosphate backbones. What is also very interesting is that the fact that um, we have a new vibrant field called synthetic biology 
which allows you to synthesize a lot of different molecules, DNA included. So all of this should serve as a motivation for the fact that DNA could be potentially used as a storage media. And uh, uh, before I proceed to explain how, let me just give you a little bit of a history of the problem. So the idea of using DNA as a storage media um, was first addressed in many uh, papers in the 60s and 70s, but it was really not uh, addressed in any plausible or practically uh, possible manner. The real breakthrough came in two papers in 2012 and 2013. And that breakthrough uh, showed that you can actually use DNA as a data storage system. And the, those two systems proposed by Church and Goldman uh, are pretty much identical, and they're very, very conceptually uh, straightforward. All you do, uh, have to do is take a binary set of strings uh, or uh, uh, a binary, long binary string, and you do encoding, but bear in mind, uh, these are works by biologists, encoding really in this context of their work meant converting binary symbols into symbols of a quaternary alphabet, which means that you would get a string of T ATGCs that represent the binary information, and then shipping it off to one of the many known companies for synthesis. Uh, my favorite go-to synthesis company is IDT, but other companies like Twist and Agilent also provide synthetic DNA products. So you would design the strings uh, uh, over a four letter alphabet, ask a company to synthesize them, and then you would get these uh, DNA products that you can sequence, or basically what that means, read out the content. And for reading out the content, the company uh, of choice is either Illumina, which uh, does uh, next generation sequencing, or Oxford Nanopores, which does what we call third generation sequencing. And then uh, you can decode the original content back, again, in the context of this work uh, from 12, 2012 and 13, decoding really means taking the letters of a quaternary alphabet and converting them back into a binary alphabet. So we got into this area, the, uh, the, a bunch of people at UIUC, um, we got excited about it because the late David McKay consulted with Goldman and he told them to use uh, differential coding, something that coding theorists know all too well. And a colleague of mine alerted it and, uh, and told me, uh, hey, there is this interesting paper that's trying to use coding for DNA-based data storage. And that was in 2013 when Goldman's paper came out. And ever since we've been trying to address a bunch of problems that were not solved with this architecture proposed by Church and Goldman. So our group was the one to propose uh, doing random access by amplifying certain strings that you want to access in this soupy pool here of synthesized DNA. Uh, we were the first group also to propose using Oxford nanopore sequencers to make the system portable. And we obviously wanted to introduce a lot of error correction. And uh, without citing a large volume of work, I would like to say that uh, Han Mao did a lot of great work um, uh, starting uh, in uh, 2013, Hussein Tabatabaye Yazdi, Greg Puglio, and Ryan Gabris, some names you may recognize from coding theory. And then um, the field really took off, in my opinion, when Microsoft Research synthesized a 200 megabyte, uh, I believe, uh, file size which got the attention of the media because before that the file sizes were rather modest and people were not sure if this technology really has a future. So this is an excerpt from one of our my favorite papers where we encoded Citizen Kane, read out the content using these nanopores, and uh, this is one of uh, the first papers that introduced very interesting trace reconstruction problems and other ideas regarding um, DNA data storage. But this is not going to be the main topic of my talk. I want to do something completely different here because all of you have probably seen this picture, or if you haven't, this was not very difficult to understand. So what I want to tell you about is something that brings up the issues that we face when trying to convince companies or people that are really in the storage industry um, in terms of why, to, why switch from uh, silicon-based storage devices or other types of magnetic storage or optical storage devices to uh, DNA. 
And the biggest obstacle is really <laughs> the stuff that you see in this table, because when you show to uh, anyone working uh, in, in the storage industry, this table, they start to uh, cringe because what you see here is if you want to order a pool of um, DNA strands of lengths, let's say between 10 and 79, and you go with the company called Com uh, Custom Array, uh, you will get uh, 92 such pieces in the concentration of one femtomol. That's a tiny, tiny amount of DNA. And what is disturbing here is the price tag it comes with. So this table here clearly illustrates, just look at the numbers on the right-hand side. It illustrates that the cost of synthetic DNA is, is incredibly high. We are talking about orders and all orders of magnitude, higher costs than standard storage media. In addition, there is a synthesis delay, long synthesis uh, procedure, because a synthesis has to be done sequentially. The machines for synthesizing are bulky. This is something that's roughly uh, the height of a human being. You can have in-house synthesizers by these companies, but they can synthesize strands that are roughly of length 100, and um, they're expensive to use and they're time consuming as well. So our issue uh, with this system was never the fact, the DNA-based storage system, was never the fact if it's doable or not. It's very doable. If you have a few thousand dollars to spare, you can do it and run your own experiment. But the point would be that you, with several thousand dollars, you would be able to store very small amounts of information. You would have to wait for a while for the company to deliver the thing, uh, the DNA to you. And when you want to read it, you would have to use sequencing devices, which also have uh, high cost of uh, readouts, but nothing compared to the high cost of synthesis. So this is, has been the stumbling block for the real applications of DNA storage. So somewhere in 2016 or 17, we started to think, why do we need to synthesize DNA? Why do we need to do this inherently slow process of synthesis? Is there any other way to store information in DNA? And um, let me try to admit someone here, thanks. So uh, the, the obvious question is everywhere you turn, DNA is somewhere uh, is around because um, even as we walk our cells shed and you have ample amounts of DNA in our cells, you have ample amounts of DNA in bacteria, in viruses, and DNA is really everywhere around you. So why are we overpaying for synthesis? And you may, uh, the thing you may tell me right away is yes, DNA is everywhere and we can easily extract it. This is a toolkit that we usually use in our lab. You order it, it costs $100. Uh, you have nice and clear instructions and you can use this simple toolkit to extract DNA from cells and get any amount, pretty much an arbitrary large amount, not femtomoles of DNA by using a toolkit like this that costs only $100. As you may guess by, uh, by now, or you know, it's obvious, DNA is storing hardwired information. It's not storing what you want it to store. It's storing information uh, that is relevant for some organism like uh, this plasmid here, for example, or some bacteria. And uh, on the right-hand side, I'm listing the genetic parts of the genetic code of a bacteria known as uh, E. coli. You all probably heard about it. And you see, there's nothing I can do. E. coli is storing its genetic content. It's not storing, for example, an image of Marlon Brando that I would like to store in, or an image of a kitten that I uh, really like. It's actually storing its own genetic information. So I cannot uh, change the content of, or the symbol content of a, of a genome easily to convert the bacterial content into an image of a Marlon Brando or a cat. So uh, is this the end of this idea of trying to use a native DNA or DNA that's uh, readily available in nature to store information rather than synthesizing DNA and paying the high price and all uh, pay, uh, dealing with um, delays and synthesis costs. So the, the key idea, the thing that really got us going in terms of thinking about this problem was an amazing breakthrough in the area of DNA editing. And you may have heard this idea uh, of DNA editing known as the CRISPR-Cas9 mechanism, which is nothing more than uh, a special immune system used by a bacteria or a bunch of bacteria 
uh, this uh, uh, CRISPR-Cas9 system and its discovery and its use in synthetic biology uh, was awarded the Nobel Prize in 2020. And two women, Charpentier and Dudna, uh, Dadna, sorry, uh, were the recipients of the Nobel Prize uh, in this area. And their discovery was amazing. They, real they realized that bacteria have a specialized immune system to fight viruses. And in a nutshell, and being pretty vague here, this system operates as follows. If a virus um, intrudes into a bacteria, it will be shredded. Pieces of that uh, 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 viral DNA will be used in uh, this CRISPR-Cas9 complex, and they will be used as guides to recognize for, uh, future in infections by the same virus through this fact that if you have uh, this guide RNA, and think of RNA just as a DNA, forget about the word RNA at this point. So it's, um, it's a short piece of a viral genome, and it's a single-stranded piece. So if a viral genome enters, uh, uh, let's say, 10 days later, and it has a recognizable sequence that this guide can recognize through bonding that I call Watson Creek complementary bonding, then this guide will attach itself to the viral DNA, and it comes with something that looks like a scissor. And those are really not scissors. Those are uh, enzymes that will cut up and shred up the viral DNA. So this, these scissors here are really what we now use for DNA editing. We can use this uh, complex, the Cas9 enzyme, to cut out different pieces of a genetic uh, double helix or of a genetic uh, code. Uh, and this is illustrated in this picture. And uh, editing is done by these enzymes and it's very efficient and it's very pre mostly precise and it allows you to cut out chunks of the DNA in the process that we call DNA editing. And the op uh, options to, for applications of this complex are immense and uh, the Nobel Prize was really awarded for potential usage of this uh, DNA editing methodology in uh, uh, medical sciences, but it made us think, what if we can really change the content of a genetic code by editing it and editing it in terms of cutting out pieces rather than changing the sequence composition of the, of the native DNA. So the lesson from this slide should be changing the content, changing an A into a T or trying to mess around with the sequence of the DNA is hard, but cutting or uh, removing pieces is easy because we, we have this amazing CRISPR-Cas9 and other uh, editing enzyme, uh, enzymes like Cas9 that can do the job for us. It's easy to do cutting and it's cheap, which is more, most importantly. So how can we use this idea to cut, uh, sorry, to record information? So think of it this way. This is your DNA. This is one sugar phosphate backbone. This is, let's say, the sense strand. This is the anti-sense strand. And now I want to store information. I'm not going to try to mess around with the bases, the ATGCs that are here. I'm going to try to cut the sugar phosphate backbone between certain bases in order to store information. And for that, I will use an enzyme like Cas9. And uh, uh, just simply put, what that enzyme will do is I will program it to cut, let's say, at this location. And it will not disturb the double helix part of my uh, strand because I can control where I'm going to introduce the cut. So if you think about this, this should remind you of punch cards. And that is really what gave a name to the whole system that I'm going to describe to you. Because this enzyme can be viewed as the punch card system. I can use this enzyme to cut or punch holes into the DNA sugar phosphate backbone at very specific locations between two uh, bases that I can choose. And uh, if you think of a punch card system, the lines or these um, rows in the punch uh, card system, those can be viewed as your DNA strands. And those little holes that we used to have in these old punch card systems can be viewed as these uh, tiny cuts that you can make on um, the DNA sugar phosphate backbones. And this is what we set out to do. And we thought maybe this sounds crazy, but it should be doable. Can we really use DNA's uh, uh, strands as punch cards and store information by uh, 
creating small holes on one of these strands at uh, or multiple holes on either one of these strands and control where the holes are made and read out the content. So the idea is to create these holes in a process that biologists call nicking. They don't use the word cutting because cutting would mean cutting both of the strands, which would lead to disintegration of the double helix. Nicking refers to just punching a, a hole in one of the two strands. So we don't cut uh, both strands at the same uh, location, corresponding location. We will uh, punch a hole in one of the strands so that we preserve the double helix structure. So we are not going to allow the double helix structure to disintegrate. And for the purpose of cutting, we are going to use a very special enzyme called PFAGO which was developed in the laboratory of uh, one of my colleagues at, at UAUC, who I will be crediting at the end of the talk. Uh, and PFAGO is special because it's also a native enzyme. It also appears in uh, uh, living bacteria and it's also a part of their immune system, but it has properties that are very um, different from Cas9 and I will bring them up in a second. So the idea is Let's try to store information by deciding to nick, to not nick, or to uh, basically to nick, uh, sorry, not to nick, which is storing a zero, to nick the sense strand, let's say this strand here, which would store a one, or to nick the anti-sense strand, which would store um, uh, a two. So what we can do is basically go down from a, a quaternary alphabet where we have four symbols, A, T, G, C, to a ternary alphabet, which involves no NIC, sense NIC, or anti sense NIC. And we will have to place the NICs a bit further apart. We will not be able to say NIC here and NIC here and NIC here and NIC here because the DNA will start to fall apart. So, with, I will show you experiments where we managed to NIC things um, 25 positions apart, but you can do even closer NICs without uh, causing the disintegration of the DNA. So this is the first idea that I will pro, pro, uh, that I'm putting forward. The interesting observation is something that we know from other storage systems. If I want to store a zero, I have to do absolutely nothing because a zero is uh, represents no nick. So I'm not going to nick, which means um, I will store a zero and I don't need to do anything. So I'm saving myself a lot of work by not having to do anything to store a zero. The other thing that is very interesting is that we can do nicking fully in parallel uh, because these uh, enzymes that I'm showing here as little clouds, they can attach themselves all in parallel like, little, like a little workhorse at different parts of the DNA as long as they're not too close to each other. And that also explains why we had to take the, base, um, the nicking positions a bit further apart, not adjacent to each other. But these enzymes can attach themselves and work fully in parallel and create holes, programmed holes, in many, many different locations uh, uh, at the same time. Uh, PFAGO, this enzyme we used, uh, uses DNA guides rather than RNA like Cas9, the Nobel Prize winning construct. And DNA is much more stable than RNA for those of you that know uh, this uh, difference. The second thing is that uh, Cas9 is a single turnover enzyme. W that means that if it punches a hole, it's going to get stuck at the location of the hole and it's hard to reuse it. And that's not what, something you want. Well, this enzyme PFAGO is what we call a multiple turnover molecule. It can punch a hole, disassociate itself from the DNA and punch a hole somewhere else as long as it sees the same sequence that needs to be punched. So PFAGO can... Uh, uh, based on our estimates, do hundreds of NICs uh, without getting tired or stuck, while Cas9 can only do one NIC, and that's why we call it a single turnover molecule. Uh, DNA, and I will discuss this in uh, a bit uh, towards the end of the talk, this uh, word, uh, approach, nicking approach, or um, cutting, punch carding approach, is perfect for in-memory computing, and you wouldn't believe it, but I urge you to check out the work that came out from the group of one of my collaborators who built the first in-memory computing paradigm 
using this idea we put forward about nicking as a storage uh, uh, idea. And it's done through the use of strand displacement, but I won't have time to discuss it today. And um, the other interesting thing, this nick DNA, which is in the form of a double helix, can be mixed, and I will talk about that in, um, uh, in the context of uh, new coding theory problems, and it can be read out via nanopores, uh, very uh, portable and efficient and cheap devices for reading the DNA content. And um, even more interestingly, you probably know that once you store information in synthetic DNA, there is no way out. You can, it's very, very hard to change the content. I already mentioned that. So all the proposals so far regarding DNA storage systems were for archival storage, because you would not try to rewrite the information. It would be impossible to do that. But nature deals with nicks and cuts on a regular basis because radiation or other oxidative damages or some other forms of damages keep breaking your sugar phosphate backbone on a regular uh, basis. And nature evolved to be able to fix these breakages and um, uh, the task of fixing falls on uh, enzymes or proteins that are called ligases. They basically can seal the holes and one ligase, T4, can seal the holes very efficiently so you can actually erase the information uh, without leaving a trace that it, it was ever there. And then you can repunch your DNA. And it's the first pretty much idea that uh, put forward that allows you to do very, very easy, permanent uh, rewriting of the information stored. What are we paying by doing this? Uh, this is very cheap. Nature created all these systems for us to use in this uh, punch card uh, uh, architecture, but we are, uh, we are, we did some computations and we believe that we uh, can uh, create uh, maybe not four orders, but at least two orders or three orders of magnitude right now, reduction in the cost of storage. But we are playing, um, we can do computing, as I mentioned, we can do 2D DNA storage, we can superimpose the NICs on um, uh, non-native DNA as well, but we are playing, uh, 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 paying a price which is um, at the cost of 30 times smaller density. Why? Because you remember, I mentioned when we punch, we punch, we don't punch, we punch sense or we punch anti-sense, which is a ternary alphabet. If you use sequence content, we have a, a quaternary alphabet. And in, uh, on top of it, we would have to keep uh, the bits a bit apart, um, the stored bits apart. Uh, 25 is an overkill, but still we need to, let's say, place the positions where we are gonna nick uh, at least 10 symbols or 10 bases apart. So that will lead to a 30 or more conservatively 50 fold reduction in density. But I will give you a hint. We didn't publish that material yet. But we came up with an extension of this idea, which will allow us to really use the NIC positions to store larger alphabets, not just zero, one, or two. Uh, but I will take this offline and discuss this idea with those of you that are interested in it. We, we call this system DNA flash memory. And it's a very interesting uh, concept that uses um, uh, another native occurring uh, enzyme to change what is really uh, present at the position of a, of a nick or a hole in the sugar phosphate backbone. So here is how the system would look like. Uh, we published it in Nature.com in 2020. It ended up being the editor highlights for, for the journal and it was covered in Scientific American as well. Uh, the flow chart for the system is as follows. You have some uh, binary data that you wanna store. You decide that these uh, binary data fragments should correspond to certain locations that you wanna use for no NIC, sense NIC, or anti sense NIC. Uh, to create the NICs, you're going to use native DNA, you're going to use bacterial DNA, use the uh, toolkit that I showed you to extract the DNA. Uh, the DNA is usually, uh, bacterial DNA is uh, roughly million in length, so you will not use all of that. So you will cut out pieces from the native DNA that we would call registers, and then you will start uh, punching those registers using these enzymes at predefined loca locations. 
Again, remember, uh, no punch at the predefined location means that location stores a zero. Um, uh, a punch on the sense strand win means uh, one, and a punch on the ante sense strand will mean uh, a two. And once you have that, you can organize these punch double stranded DNA, native DNAs, into a microplate, as we call it. And once you need to read it, you will do what is done usually in um, high sequencing readouts. You will uh, prepare a library and sequence it using either nanopores or uh, using high throughput sequencing devices, as I will explain a little bit in more detail in the next slides. So I will skip the bioinformatics part for the sake of time. Uh, the bioinformatics uh, uh, part comes into the picture here for the simple reason that we need to find out which uh, native uh, bacterial DNA is the best one to use for this purpose and to find which sites are amenable for nicking. So you it's not equally easy to nick some sites because uh, uh, to nick a site, you need to be able to ensure that only that site will be nicked and nothing else, which means that the guides or the uh, look, uh, sequence content around the nicking site has to be fairly unique in the genome. Uh, and uh, the procedure we took is classical bioinformatics. We did uh, K-mer analysis and we decided to go, as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, with the E. coli K12 um, bacteria. It's a gram-negative bacteria, which means it's very easy to extract the DNA content. And uh, it allows us to basically come up with nicking sites that are uh, not uh, uh, replicated too much through the register sequences we use, which would allow us to control uh, very precisely where the nicks or punches are added in the genomic code. So uh, as I mentioned already, the sites that we were after, they had to have certain sequence composition, AT and GC content between 40 and 60, no long runs of Gs, and bioinformatics helped us identify which parts of the E. coli genome to use and which sites to designate as the punch sites for our nicking enzyme. So uh, this is basically the bioinformatics part just told us how to find the DNA uh, and which parts of the DNA to isolate. The nicking part I already explained. Let me now explain how do we uh, easily read the recorded data. So what, you, what we did is we nicked or punched holes in the double-stranded DNA constructs. And we have different fragments of DNA coming from different parts of the E. coli genome. So this was one part of the E. coli genome, another part, another part, and all of these have little holes either on the sense or anti-sense strand and some pre-designated positions. So how would we read the content? We would heat up this DNA, and when you heat up DNA, you're causing denaturation, which means the double helix starts to split on its own. And the interesting thing now is when it starts splitting, what happens is because you have holes on these uh, single strands here, it starts to disintegrate into shorter fragments. So this red fragment probably came from this red part of DNA, uh, and it was capped by two punches or holes, let's say on this side and in this side. This one was uh, just the anti-sense strand that seemed not to be punched at all. So these fragments that we see are pieces of the original genome, but they're uh, pieces that are flanked by the positions of the nicks on, on the left and on the right, because we punched holes here. When we split the double helix, you get all these fragments that are created because once you split the double helix, the shorter fragments come about because of the fact that they corresponded to two nicks uh, adjacent, uh, that are flanking that uh, fragment. So now you have all these fragments. You do library preparation, which means you create double-stranded DNA back, and then you just send it out to a classical sequencing de uh, device like Illumina, for example. But what is interesting is now Illumina can deal with fragments that are all of different length. These are fragments that have widely different lengths that are dictated by where did you actually punch a hole or not. And now that you have these fragments, you wonder how would I know where the nicks were or what the information was? Guess what? You know the original sequence. This is part of the original sequences of 
E. coli. Everybody knows the sequence. You have the sequence, you will find your short fragments and you will do what we call reference alignment because you know what the fragment was. You will find the pieces and then you will align these pieces, basically uh, find the locations where these pieces fall. And then you will use that lo those locations to figure out where did the nicks happen or did not happen. So for example, here is a picture of a early experiment. It says we found this fragment here and this fragment uh, aligned to the beginning of this trend. Then we found these two fragments, they align to this location and this location. But what you see is that all these fragments tile up one uh, set of locations. So this fragment starts here, ends here. 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 So you're doing really a tiling of this reference string and you know exactly where the holes were because that's where you are going to see the transition from one fragment to another. So for example, if there was a, a location where you could have punched something here, but you don't see a fragment like this, that means that you recorded a zero at this location because there was no punch. So the assembly of this puzzle, which is very easy because you have to figure out where the pieces came from in the reference, that assembly tells you exactly where the holes were and you can read the information easily from there. So you can read the NICs faster. You don't need to go through this procedure. This procedure is very standard and very straightforward to do but you can do it faster. You can use these nanopores, which are basically holes in a membrane and you pass the DNA through it. Apparently NICs are damages in the DNA that cause uh, a significant change in the signal or in the current of the nanopore. And we observed and we published two papers in one in Nature Com, uh, in the Nature Publishing Group um, in collaboration with the Radenovich and Liberton lab that showed uh, that you can actually detect these damages in DNA, these nicks or cuts uh, or um, punches using nanopores, but I won't go into details um, uh, because it would take us off the main path a bit too much. So let me show you some experimental results um, that explain how well the system works. So we used the robotic system, a so-called echo machine that will do everything automated for us. We use these uh, well plates for the echo machine, which is uh, going to disperse the DNA into different tiny wells here, and then add the enzymes needed, needed for punching. And then we program the machine, and it's a really um, pretty substantial project for a student to learn how to program the echo machine, but I was lucky enough to have a student who was really good with this. He uh, programmed the machine and he created a library of all possible two to the 10 punches on one single uh, uh, DNA fragment, which is basically giving us 10, 000, uh, uh, 1,024 pools of nicked samples, every nicking pattern over a binary alphabet, because in the first experiment, we basically decided not to try to nick both the sense and anti-sense strand because we wanted to see if this whole thing makes sense. And what we did is we took Lincoln's Gettysburg address and an image of his memorial. Uh, this work was done around the time when Donald Trump became president and some of us were not happy with it. So we wanted to go back to uh, Lincoln as the president at that point. So here are uh, here is the image we encoded. This is a picture we took of the Lincoln Memorial. And these are just some bit, uh, ten, uh, fragments of 10 bits that we uh, um, uh, took out of this image to illustrate how we encoded them. So basically you have 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0. It means you had four punches. So these punches would have been 1, 2, 3, 4 here. So these are lo the locations of the punches and these are the four ones that correspond to the punches. And you know that these are the locations where we punch something because we saw this fragment, this fragment, this fragment, this fragment, and this fragment, but we didn't see this uh, fragment disintegrate into something smaller, which means there was no punch, no punch, and then a punch happened only at the third location, which is here. So here is another illustration. It shows that we had um, four punches uh, and it was, um, uh, 
or um, this is for a different scale. So basically it doesn't seem like maybe this was a different punching system. Let me look at this one here. So you, uh, this is a different scale, so don't be confused. These are the four punches. This is saying punch everything. So you really will have 10 punches, one here, two here, three here, four here, five here, six, seven, and so on. So I hope this idea is clear. And these are actual readouts that we got uh, this is um, the readouts um, uh, data that we get, and this is how we convert it into the fragment counts and alignments. And it basically very clearly tells you the exact uh, set of bits that you stored. So, uh, uh, sorry? Can I ask you a question, if you don't mind? Sure, sure, sure. How, how do you know in the green that it's mm -hmm. not uh, one, one, and then a zero? Because, uh, because I, I have uh, predetermined locations. These are the locations I chose with the bioinformatics tools that oh, only see. these locations will be punched. I will not allow anything else to be punched. Oh, so the, so, oh, so, sorry. The, so like the symbol sizes or like the width are not really, uh, they're not, it's basically, it's, it's not constant width. Oh, yeah, 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 right. That's a great observation. No, because you remember I said we have to find punching sites that are amenable for punching Understand. that are not going to be confused with other sites. So that was the bioinformatics part that I rushed through. We okay. had to identify sites that we could easily nick. So since we are working with bacterial DNA, we cannot be... Uh, to, uh, you know, we cannot allow, uh, we cannot make the punches be regularly spaced because we need to have the right locations to place the punches in terms of the properties that I mentioned. So yes, yeah, these fragments will not be uniform length. So you, so, you pre, so you essentially, you prefix all the sites and then you either, mm -hmm. um, you have a, a ternary, um, like a three-way decision what to do mm -hmm. at that site. Yes, exactly. Right now I'm showing you binary results. I'll get to the ternary right away. Okay, but good. this is basically the locations are predetermined and that's also pretty good because I know where to expect the nick or not. And we don't see any errors. It was actually amazing how well these enzymes work and how precise it is. Look, uh, these are typical results we got. We just do the sequence alignment, we do the counts. And unfortunately, you can probably not see these numbers here. They tell you how many fragments we saw. We saw huge numbers of fragments that are of this form. So we know there was right. no punch, no punch. Let me see. It wasn't really perfectly aligned. Uh, and that's because I stretched the images. <laughs> so it, I should have aligned them better because this one here is of length really three. It should have ended here. Maybe it is aligned. So you okay. see this, this should align with each other. So, but this is just for a binary alphabet right now. Thank you. Yeah, okay. and if you do the uh, ternary alphabet, that in this case, we can punch sense or anti-sense. And for example, here is the result when we punched both sense and anti-sense. Now you have to be careful. Now you have two strings that you have to assemble because if this string has one content, the other one will have the Watson Creek complementary content. So you need to, this red could be, let's say the sense strand and the blue could be the complementary sense um, or anti-sense strand. And now you have a different set of fragments for the sense strand and a different sense of frag, uh, uh, sets of fragments for the anti-sense strand because you're cutting both. And this set tells you this was what was stored on the sense and this was what was stored on the anti-sense strand. And again, even if you do nicking of both, you basically get very clear pictures of these insert diagrams, as we call them. And then you can do even much more because I showed you only what happens when we nick one single strand. Uh, I mentioned when I was discussing how we found which sites to nick, you can take different registers, we call them uh, orthogonal registers, which means nothing else than different fragments of the DNA. And these fragments of E. coli have very little sequence similarity. We computed the Lovenstein distance between them. They have a very large Lovenstein distance. And we took five of these fragments. And these fragments, if you nick one of them, the other one will not be nicked because it has nothing similar to the nicking sites that you selected here. And these you can mix and nick in parallel. And the question is, when you mix them, can you still figure out uh, the content and do the alignment properly because maybe there is a run length of A's here and another run length of A's here. Maybe that will confuse the alignment procedure. Not at all. 
So this result here shows you we mixed five different registers. We punched them uh, simultaneously in the same pool. And these are the inserts for these five registers, uh, sense and anti-sense. And you can tell we managed without any problem to figure out which piece went, uh, came from which register. And we, get it this we got this nice uh, tiling of five different sequences simultaneously. And you can do this both for the sense and anti-sense strand as well. So this basically demonstrates this simple result I'm showing here. Uh, that you can take different nicking sites on different strands, different numbers, you can mix and match any way you want, use the, uh, punch, uh, the punching enzymes and do the alignment and you would still be able to perfectly recover the information you had at the beginning. Since I'm running out of time, I'm not going to talk about the fact that you can also use this uh, system for the first time to have bitwise random access. We never had bitwise random access be before and it's non-destructive because we are using fluorescent labels to read out uh, the actual value of a bit at a certain position. Was it zero? Was it one? Or was there no punch there at all? Uh, sorry, was it a zero which means no punch or was it a one or a two? You can read more about this non-destructive bitwise random access in the paper. And then we extended it. This is a, a line of work that I'm especially fond of. Uh, we just submitted it a few days ago. It's called 2D DNA because you don't even need to worry about getting a bacterial DNA. You can actually work with synthetic DNA and we ordered a large amount of synthetic DNA encoding Marlon Brando images. I mentioned these a little bit during my plenary talk at ISIT. And uh, you can find some very rudimentary um, uh, pr uh, prior results uh, in a paper from ICASP. But as I mentioned, we just submitted it. It's on the bioarchive. So we are not using now bacterial genomes. We are actually using uh, synthetic DNA that stores image information. And now we are using our punch card system to store metadata. So for example, metadata that says this was the godfather. Uh, this was uh, Julius Caesar or some other metadata. When was the movie made? And when I mention this, people say, why can't you store that information uh, separately uh, in another piece of DNA? And this is the reason why, because I can rewrite the content. And you know that metadata needs often frequent rewriting. So if I write, I punch holes. And I mentioned that nature created these ligases which are there to fix holes because holes happen during the natural life of a DNA. And these uh, ligases fix the hole. So the ligases perform all the erasures or fixing of the holes. They erase the information and then you can rewrite it. So what we thought of is, okay, let's do an experiment, a bunch of experiments where we can show that we can write ownership information about um, the images we have. So we took this Marlon Brando image here, the Godfather, and I will not go into details. As I said, the paper should be available on BioArchive rather soon. We stored metadata encoding Illinois in the form of punches in this image of Marlon Brando in a way that I'm gonna skip the, the details, detailed explanation. Then we applied the T4 DNA ligase. We erased everything. We did the check. We found not a single fragmented piece of DNA, which was quite unbelievable. For a long time, we thought that maybe we are making mistakes, but the counts were actually zero for fragments uh, of um, uh, shorter length. And then we rewrote Granger because, as you know, uh, um, either or may know, in the engineering department was recently named the Granger College of Engineering. So we just uh, first wrote Illinois, erased everything using T4 uh, ligase, and then we rewrote Granger and we managed to recover both the images, the image information and uh, the nicked information using the uh, ideas that I described before. You can fill in the dots. So now I'm coming to the part that most of you were probably waiting for and it comes a bit too late, but I thought it would be really nice to show you a new system and then make you think, oh my God, where, where is coding theory coming into the picture here? Because uh, maybe you got cold feet. I showed you we had no errors. And I felt the same way. I said, oh, okay, I'm a coding theorist. I would love to have some errors, but we really don't see any. Don't be worried. There are plenty of beautiful coding theory problems associated with this uh, uh, question here. 
and they really don't have much to do with error correction. So let me start with two problems because I'm running out of time and we can take offline a lot of other problem discussions, especially uh, regarding this uh, punch card flash memory that I mentioned, watermarking applications and a bunch of other things. So what are the new coding problems that we saw here? So the new coding, coding problems really have something to do with not letting our double-stranded DNA disintegrate. You remember I said we shouldn't punch too close and we shouldn't punch um, too many things on the sense strand uh, consecutively or on the anti-sense strand. So imagine if you selected a location here and you punched the sense and then you selected a location very close and you punched anti-sense or you punched a bunch of locations very close to each other. Your DNA may start falling apart, your double-stranded DNA. Think of a tape that you cut in too many places, even if it's two sticky tapes and you cut them, they will start to disassociate. So what we need to do is we need to balance out the nicks on both strands to basically prevent such disassociation or disintegration to happen. So if you use uh, nicking locations uh, labeled by one to N, uh, remember we said if we place a nick on the sand strand, we are gonna call it a one, let's say it's a plus. If it's on the anti-sand strand, we, we can call it a minus. If there is no nick, we will just call it zero. So for example, here in this location, I had a nick on the sand strand, it will be labeled plus. On the anti-sense in the next location, minus, sense, plus, and then there was no nick here because there was no cloud, no enzyme that would attach itself, so that would be a zero. So I will call this one, two, three a nicking pattern because it tells me I nicked at location one, two, and three. Uh, I'm not telling you if I nicked uh, the sense or anti-sense, but I used these three locations. I did not use the fourth location, and I call this the nicking pattern. So here is what we want to do. First of all, uh, we want to avoid two nicking patterns, such as one, two, three, and let's say uh, one, three, four, because uh, the only thing that could potentially go wrong is that some enzymes may not have been prepared well, they may not be active, active enough, something may have been wrong with our selection of the nicking location. So if I have uh, a nicking pattern one, two, three, and one, three, four, these agree in two uh, positions, one and three, but disagree in two. But let's say that enzymes that were supposed to operate on position two and four were not active, you would be confusing these two nicking patterns. So my nicking patterns will be sets, and I want these sets to have small intersection because I don't want to risk misinterpreting nicking patterns uh, base, ba uh, used for storing one uh, binary string for a nicking, information, uh, nicking pattern used for storing another binary string. And that is basically because maybe our location for the nicks is not uh, well chosen or the enzymes, which may happen, may fail to create punches at, the, at certain locations. So I want the nicking patterns to be sets and I want them to have small intersection. And in addition, I want these uh, 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 nicking sites to be used in a smart way so that I don't place them all on the sense strand versus the anti-sense strand. I want to mix them up so that I balance out how many nicks are placed on the strand, uh, sense and anti-sense strand in order to prevent this association. So this gives rise to the following problem. So if you have a V that is a set of integers, let's say one, two V, uh, which denotes the set of sites that you're going to nick. Then we are going to design a family of blocks, which are nothing more than K regular subsets of this ground set, one, two, V, meaning the, all these sets here are going to have size K. So their cardinality is K and we will call them blocks, okay? So what we want based on the discussion regarding enzyme, we want these blocks to have um, uh, bounded intersections. So we want the blocks to be, di as the, the nicking patterns to be as diverse as possible. So we don't want to have two nicking patterns that have way too many common nicking sites. And we captured this by saying that we want these blocks in FV to have what we call T-bounded intersections for all distinct uh, indices I and J. 
And that means that the cardinality of fi intersect fj should be less than t, okay? And this should help us with potential issues with the nicking enzymes being unoperational. If we have this bounded intersection property, now we want to add the property that we are balancing out the number of nicks placed on the uh, sense and anti-sense strand. And for this, we will label each location with the plus or minus one to indicate if that location is supposed to be used uh, in terms of uh, creating a nick on the sense or on the anti-sense strand. So these labelings here tell you sense or anti-sense. And for each of these blocks, we will compute what is called the discrepancy, which says, uh, uh, which is nothing more than the sum of the labels of the elements in that set. And the discrepancy should be small if we, are not, if we nicely balanced out the number of uh, sites that are going to be nicked on the sense and anti-sense strand. And there is a large literature in the area of set discrepancy. You may have heard about it, but this is completely different because the sets we are working with have this additional assumption that they need to have very small intersection. And we consulted a number of people that worked on set discrepancy. If this problem was new, we got a green light. Most of the set discrepancy theory never, uh, um, never dealt with special constraints on the sets. In this case, uh, 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 constraints regarding the size of the intersection of the sets. So we, we went along with this problem. It turns out that something slightly related was addressed by Charlie Colburn. Uh, in the context of uh, colorings of Steiner systems. And um, you can uh, uh, see that in the paper that I will mention in a minute. But the goal of the coding theory problem addressed here is to find the largest collection of sets that have bounded, T-bounded intersection, and for which we can find the labeling such that the discrepancy of each of the constituent sets lies in the set zero plus one minus one. And obviously you can extend this, allow yourself a little bit more freedom, maybe zero plus one, minus one, plus two, minus two, but uh, the discrepancy should be small. So this is one coding problem that I'm pretty sure would not have crossed your mind if you haven't seen the system I described, hopefully. And uh, since I'm running out of time, I'll just give you the reference. This was a very recent paper that appeared in the SIAM Journal of Discrete Mathematics. And as I mentioned, it's joint work by, with Charlie Colburn and uh, the lead authors were Ryan Gabris and uh, Huang Dao. And uh, the title is Set Codes with Small Intersections and Small Discrepancies, which just describes what I uh, told you. So the second thing that you again would not have expected to see or work on in the terms of a, uh, as a coding problem, if you haven't seen the system that I explained to you, is what we call run length limited group testing. And uh, what, why do we need something like run length group uh, limited group testing? So I mentioned uh, uh, early on that each of these registers is uh, stored in a separate well, and that makes it a little bit, these re register, I mean, um, a DNA strand. Uh, it's the same strand, but with a different set of uh, punches. So this is one strand, it got punched here, 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 here. It's the same DNA strand, but it got punched at different locations. Unfortunately, we have to store them in a spatial order to know which strand came before the other strand. But we would like to mix them and have some way to distinguish these strands who came first. But here is a problem. If we were to put these together, when we read them out, we would have trouble here because we would figure out that this piece, blue piece, had to be associated with this blue piece and this blue piece, because where this piece ends, this piece starts, this piece ends, this fragment starts. And it couldn't have been mixed up with these guys because they have different start and end positions. But once you reach this location, you have two strands, this pink one here and this blue one here that start at the same location. So you wouldn't know if this pink prefix was actually associated with this blue suffix or was this pink uh, uh, was this pink suffix associated with this blue one blue prefix or uh, vice versa so once you reach a point where you have two fragments starting at the same position you're in trouble because you wouldn't be able to distinguish if you mix these samples uh, 
are these guys really part of this punching system or a punching uh, uh, punch uh, punch register or are these here to be associated with this uh, uh, punch DNA? So uh, how would we resolve this problem? So we, we realized, okay, this looks like something we can use group testing for and we could use a Lindstrom scheme and this is what we did in the uh, Nature paper. Uh, but an interesting um, uh, uh, thing is, uh, I won't describe in detail why group testing, but each of these registers will be treated as a individual or a defect or, or a entity that you're trying to test. And the binary encoding of the punches will be the signature of this individual or a signature of the test subject in group testing. But there is a caveat to it. Because you remember we are placing punches and we don't want the DNA to disintegrate. So we want to make sure that punches are suf uh, placed sufficiently far from each other. So what you would have is it, when you create your group testing matrix where basically the uh, columns represent the DNA uh, fragments that you want to mix. So these would be the fragments. It's the same DNA content, but with different nicking patterns. You want to mix them all together. Uh, if you view, this, uh, uh, register, uh, view these registers in terms of their binary encodings of the positions of the nicks, what you would get is basically the signatures of these registers. But the, uh, if I were to use a simple group testing matrix, there would be no guarantee that two ones don't appear adjacent to each other which would mean that I could place NICs very close to each other and that would ca potentially cause disintegration. So the key idea was to try to figure out if we can design group testing schemes that use uh, either uh, disjunct matrices or separable matrices such that between every two ones, we have a certain run of zeros of length at least D. So we call this run length limited group testing. And it's really motivated by this idea of trying to mix DNA fragments uh, that uh, have the same sequence content, but different punch, uh, punched uh, uh, holes, mixing them together into one well in terms of, uh, in order to store in the volume of the micro well plates used. But the fact that we don't want the uh, NICs to be placed too close to each other and cause this integration is captured by the fact that uh, uh, between any two ones in the group testing matrix, we want to have a, a fairly long run or at least sufficiently long run of zeros, which means no punches. So this work was first published in ISIT 2020 and we called it run length constraint group testing. And the very interesting, at least in my opinion, result that we found is that imposing run length constraints for certain reasonable choices of the run length D parameter will not change the number of tests you need. Basically, it will not change how, um, uh, how many rows you can have in this matrix. So you remember um, in um, classical group testing, these rows would represent indices that describe the tests themselves, why these um, uh, columns would be indexed by the individuals you're testing. And surprisingly, the run length constraint does not uh, change the smallest value for a group testing scheme, uh, smallest number of rows that you need to use in order to ensure that the matrix is, let's say, disjunct or separable. So you can read again more about it in this ISIT paper. And at some point, hopefully, we will finish up the a longer journal version. So I could go on and tell you so much more about interesting mathematical questions that come up um, using these systems. So uh, for DNA flash memory, we have a very interesting collection, new collection of problems regarding rank modulations. We are using uh, um, watermark, we are using the system for watermarking, undestructive, uh, non-destructive watermarking, which is something again, that's not possible in, uh, the classical systems because watermarks uh, usually create noise because they're superimposed on images in the same dimension. Think of the watermarks operating at the uh, nicking level rather than in the images themselves. 
themselves. And then when you want to create uh, permanent watermarks, you have to seal the nicks off with certain molecules. And that's an interesting process that I didn't describe at all. And it creates a bunch of interesting math questions as well. And I mentioned earlier on my colleagues, David Soloveitchik from uh, UT Austin and Mark Riddle from uh, uh, University of Minnesota that are co-funded uh, by a DARPA grant came up with this beautiful work in in-memory computing using NICS and they have plenty of very very intriguing error correction problems there. These problems are associated with something that is known uh, as leakage during strand displacement. So if you're interested in that, I will be happy to refer you to a bunch of papers. So with this, I would just like to mention that I talked about a large number of papers that I didn't cite because the list would be probably meaningless uh, for the reason that you want to remember all of them, but you can go on Google Scholar or some other site and dig out most of these papers. And I had the privilege to work with some amazing students. I want to single out Kasra and Chao that are in my group that did a lot of work on uh, uh, um, 2D DNA storage and on the punch card system. Uh, Boya is and David are doing um, in-memory computing and Boya got the best paper award at the molecular computing conference for her idea in terms of how to use Nick, nicking, uh, nick information stored in NICs for in-memory computing. And then that work was extended by Mark and his student Tongling. And then at EPFL, I worked with some amazing people that did uh, uh, nanopore experiments for detecting NICs. And obviously, uh, uh, not the last one to mention, amazing collabora collaboration with Charlie Colburn. Uh, who we have another project uh, with a bunch of interesting questions regarding uh, uh, design theory and its application to uh, both molecular storage and distributed storage. So with this, um, I know I went a little bit over time. Thank you a lot for your attention and I'm looking forward to your questions. Thanks a lot. All right. Hey, <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, so I think uh, Professor Milankovic will be happy to take in uh, any questions. So um, feel free to unmute your mic and uh, yeah, uh, ask a question. If not, I will. Maybe I should start off. Maybe, maybe it was confusing. No, 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 no. That's a different. Bio. Maybe I should have talked more about coding than bio, but I thought it would be good to see. Maybe you guys can find some new pro coding problems in addition to the several ones I mentioned. No, it, no, no. This, this is interesting. Uh, I'm just curious for the. Eh? Sorry, did someone ask yeah. a question? Yeah, can I ask a question? Okay, sure, sure, sure. Go ahead. Yeah. Just now you mentioned that if you use a uh, nanopore sequencing, right? Mm -hmm. So you can read the NICs much faster. And, yeah, uh, right. So, yeah. Did you observe any noise with this uh, nanopore sequencing? Because we know that for synthetic DNA, right? So the mm -hmm. nanopore sequencing uh, will result in a much higher raw error rate co comparing with Illumina uh, sequencing, right? Yeah, 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 of course. Let me just go back. We are blessed because we are working with native DNA. We didn't try it with the Marlon Brando images. We have a reference. We know exactly at which location to look. So let me show you something. And this was slightly cheating um, with the paper with Alexandra we also published, I think in 2019 or so. This is the actual raw current readout. Do you see how um, the, the current drops a lot? And uh, then it goes a little bit up and it drops. We called it a 212 pattern. Uh, we actually didn't uh, use just the nick, we cheated a little bit. We extended the hole a little bit. We extended okay. it to make it slightly longer. So I think we went with several, we removed because you can edit and remove a few bases around the nick. And what happens is when you have a hole, you block the current less in the nanopore. So that's why you see these 212 events. You see 
the current drops because double-stranded DNA is in there, but then it suddenly jumps a little bit because single-stranded DNA showed up for a second. And that's because we removed around the nick, about the pun around the punch, we removed a few bases to create a slightly bigger hole. And that bigger hole, we call it a toe hole, is easily detectable. You can even see it in the raw current. These events, the, we call them the 212 events, are clearly visible in the raw current. And uh, you know, in addition to it, you know, because you have a reference, you know where to expect the holes. And if you see a change in the current that is not even that big, let's say something like this, it doesn't look that big, but if it's at the right location, because you know which location you expect to see a hole, you may not see it, but you, you, uh, you expect this is a designated location for a potential hole, you see something like this, you say, okay, this looks like a 212 event, and we pretty much never got wrong. It's much, much harder to read the sequence content than to detect holes I in see. the DNA. So, so it's much easier to do it. And that's why we really didn't have many issues with that. What is challenging is if you leave it just as a hole, you, uh, you may not see it. <laughs> We, we cheated, as I mentioned, oh, I we see, extended see. the holes a little bit by creating a larger gap, a little bit uh, of a space that we call a toe hold, and then that becomes very easy to read. But just detecting a single punch, we showed that in theory you should be able to do it, but we didn't manage to make the experiments work in practice yet because we may not have found the right four. Uh, but we're uh, 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 Leberton Labs uh, with Leberton's group. We published a paper which shows theoretically it should be possible to even detect uh, a single punch, just a tiny hole. But with Alexandra, we extended it a little bit. We created a gap of a few um, bases, and that you can easily detect. So it's like you're. It's like a way to. Uh, increase the signal to noise ratio. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, Ch <laughs> chop out a little bit more, and your signal to noise ratio will go up quite yeah. a lot. Right? Yeah, I see. So, yeah. so, uh, wait, uh, so, um, to detect yeah. the toe hole, do you need, um, do you? I mean, in your experience, do you need the reference, or is there? There's no. There's no difference between having a reference or not. No, I mean, we can detect it. We don't really need the reference. Uh, okay. With Alexandra, we published that paper with Radenovich uh, lab. We published that paper before we finished the punch card system. Uh, we just wanted to see, can we detect structural changes in the DNA? Because it seemed like at that time, people were so interested for medical applications to detect different changes in the DNA, such, something mm. like methylations of Cs or other things. And um, there, were, um, there was interest in trying to detect topological changes in DNA, and the punches are really topological changes. I so see. we started with that, and we realized just a single nick that was hard to detect, but you extend it a little bit, you remove a few bases, you create a slightly larger hole, you see it. Uh, you see it um, in the raw current, and we had to do it with Alexandra's lab because uh, Oxford is not designed for this kind of, uh, mm, of course. Yeah. yeah. So I'm curious: is uh, are there? Uh, I mean, besides DNA, uh, the data storage, are there are there applications that looks at looking at um, toe holes in um, synthetic DNA? Uh, no. 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 Okay. Uh, um, so we it's, did uh, we did this two D DNA. So the two D DNA. This is synthetic DNA, and we created the punches, the holes. Mm. To write metadata, we rewrote metadata, we wrote new metadata without any errors, and we can easily do it even on synthetic data. The, the point is that we didn't create toe holds because we already showed that if you create toe holds, you can read the content, but there was no problem here because, again, the way we stored the information this time was in the presence or absence of an enzyme. Again, presence or absence of a nicked, uh, lo uh, nick location or a, ni a nick or a punch at the given location. So again, we could use the reference alignment because uh, when you store these nicked images, you can first seal off, you, you split your DNA pool, you seal off some of it, 
you read out the image without any problems because you seal the holes. And then you use a small amount of the DNA where the holes are not sealed to read the metadata by disintegrating the DNA and uh, assembling the fragments like I explained before. But then again, you have the reference because you first reconstructed the image and then you align the NIC position to the image. So it's effectively doing the same thing as if you had a reference. And uh, in this case, we just used the Illumina because if we had used nanopores on the images directly, we would have been in trouble because um, as Kui said, we, we really have a large error rate. And in this particular paper, we tried to avoid error correction redundancy because it adds a lot to the cost of DNA. So we used image in painting, image enhancement from computer vision, a paper called bringing uh, old images back to life to restore the images rather than doing anything in terms of error correction. Um, uh, Ogitsa, can I ask a question? Yeah, yeah sure, sure. Uh, so like you mentioned you can read um, your um, uh, punch cards via Illumina or Nanopore. Mm -hmm. uh, what you do by Illumina, you actually disintegrate and then you read the single strands, right? Uh, you create the library, which is double-stranded, but the library comes from the single-stranded fragments. Right. right. Mm -hmm. when, like when you are doing with the nanopore, there's no mm -hmm. disintegration. You're just taking the, 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 the double helix mm -hmm. and putting it through a process and then reading. Um, right. But right. How, I'm, I'm just curious, like maybe this is a, um, like a newbie question, but how, mm -hmm. how can you know which strand was punched when you do nanopore sequencing? Oh, like, for nano, oh, that's a very good question, actually. It's not a newbie. Uh, with nanopore sequencing, you cannot tell which strand was punched. So for that, you have to use a binary alphabet. Oh, got it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we did not figure that out. I think that's going to be insanely hard to do. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The one thing that we tried, and that goes back to the idea of watermarking and flash memories, is you can seal... Uh, or do something, let's not call it seal. You can do something to the locations of the NICs. Um, and I can tell you, if we stop recording, I can tell you what we did <laughs> because we didn't publish this yet. So um, uh, I can tell you offline if it's not recorded. And in that case, you can actually tell uh, exactly apart if it was um, uh, sense or anti-sense. And if you stay along after the recording, I'll explain it to you because yeah. uh, this is, uh, you know, the area is a bit competitive and everything you say sometimes trickles down and the students are really disappointed when yeah. some, oh, someone beat us to this idea. But um, I'll tell you as soon as the recording is over, I'll tell you exactly how to do it. I right, got it. Sure. Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> Sorry. Um, so any <laughs> questions? <laughs> <laughs> so should we continue? <laughs> okay, uh, any other questions? Oh, hi, I have a question. Can you go back a, a few slides earlier? Yeah, so sure. the, uh, oh, the group testing? No, the reading one. The, oh, the reading. The, the very beginnings one. Uh, this one? Uh, yes, okay. So, so here, first, Ali, uh, I want to compare the, the model. So, mm -hmm. for example, the, the, the regular, the normal, the synthesized uh, DNA is one we have that, uh, if we, we can synthesize a lot of copies of the DNA sequence, right? Mm -hmm. But compared to this model, firstly, the input one, is it fixed? Mm -hmm. Like if you have like, uh, you have uh, like 10, in the beginning, you have only 10 DNA sequence. So mm -hmm. your, your pool, your DNA, your DNA pool there is only, from that 10 DNA sequence, is it? It's not, you don't have like multiple copies or anything. No, no, no. The, the reason why the cost went down is native DNA is massive, massive. I showed you that when you pay that yes, large yes. amount, you get fentomols, while here you can have huge amounts of DNA. So, okay, you... I see. So, here you say that when you heat up, then mm -hmm. the H DNA sequence here will be. Uh, uh, broke down, right? It's like two fragments. Yeah, it will bro bro uh, Yeah, it will disintegrate based on where did you create the holes. Yes. Because there's yeah. nothing else to keep the holes together, so it starts falling apart. Yeah. Okay. So when you do, uh, when you read, you want to uh, align all these fragments mm -hmm. uh, based on sequence alignment, right? 
Mm -hmm. So I wonder what is the complexities here because like possibly you can align the fragment from the other DNA sequence to the, uh, you know, um, because like there may be like you, you take up the wrong fragment from the other DNA sequence yeah. and then align yeah. it. So, so this is how we solved it. We had two different solutions. We take what is called orthogonal registers, which means sequences, you can mix them. They have very little sequence similarity, so you wouldn't be able to confuse two oh, different okay. strands. So these would be called orthogonal registers because they're taken from different pieces of the DNA. We even called it metagenomic storage because you don't even have to stick to one species. You can take it from different bacteria and all that. But the sequences are chosen in such a way that if you try to align, Oh, you I may see. share the same uh, uh, recognition site, but the context of that recognition site in one register, orthogonal register, will be very different than in the other. Oh, okay. So you will know exactly from which piece it came from. And the second one was, even if you were to use the same sequence, but punch it in different locations and try to store two uh, such same sequences but punch differently in the same location and try to dis distinguish them, then you need to use this um, 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 mixing strategy that looks like group testing. So you cannot mix everything because as I showed in this example here, if you have two strands like this, those you shouldn't mix. If you punch, sorry, it's the same strand but you did punching here and then you did punching here. Oh then these two, you wouldn't be able to uniquely reconstruct them because at this point you're confused. Are these pieces supposed to go with this or are, um, are they gonna go with this, with this side? So, so that, that, that is why we make sure that things like this cannot happen. You can interpret this in only one way because we are not going to allow a code word that has this as a prefix and this as a suffix. Oh, I see. It's, see? Like, it's, like, it's like unique decodability. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But it's not uh, your standard unique decodability in so far that it really looks more like group testing because right, uh, right, right. you can you, you just want to make sure that you cannot misinterpret the binary or, or in this case, the sum of the fragment numbers in a way that you can get confused and think this guy was going with this piece because I'm going to prohibit a punching word that has a punch here, a punch here, and then punches here, 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 and here. And if I prohibit having that as a signature, then I will always know that this had to go with this rather than this being combined with this piece, uh, with these pieces here. Okay. Um, so so I the have... design of, oh, oh sorry. Uh, oh, sorry. I just, yeah, I just wrote up this. Uh, so for the design of the register, this is very um, dependent on the native DNA that you're using, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so uh, is is so you have a do you have a is your approach greedy or more or less I don't know is a optimization is in uh, no, is this an MP hard problem or no Ooh. no I think uh, the, you have so much native DNA out there you can find uh, and we did this unique sequence uh, recover um, and it it means something completely different we did a statistical analysis it took some time ah, okay, okay. to figure sure. out. Um, uh, so basically, one thing that is known, and it's used a lot in an area called uh, metagenomic assembly, metagenomes, if you take, for example, the bacteria from your gut, you have thousands of different bacteria, mm -hmm. and you want to do the same thing. You want to figure out which bacteria are there, but you cannot isolate them separately. You mm -hmm. need to sequence them in a pool, and that's called metagenomic sequencing and metagenomic mm -hmm. assembly. So uh, one thing that's known is that most bacteria have some unique patterns. And uh, after length 20 or so, you will most likely not see the pattern repeated. More, uh, It will appear at once or not at all in a genome. And most bacteria have their unique patterns and that's what's used to figure out what kind of species do you have in your gut. So this is what we were after as well. You can do this analysis for how many strings, unique strings, unique identifiers of different lengths do you have? And it took Hussein a lot of time. I mean, computationally, it took some time to figure out uh, which strings to take out, but uh, we were only focused on E. coli. You can use other bacteria, mix it up, 
uh, it will take a little bit of time to figure out which registers to use. But once you find the registers, that's it. I mean, you can uh, find a lot of them and you can use all of them. It's just the pre-processing step, if you want to call it that way. Okay. Um, so uh, can I ask one last question? So, sorry for all the... Oh, no, no, no. Worries. So I have a question about CRISPR. Can um, the, the CRISPR-Cas9, can, can you... I mean, basically, you, you're using CRISPR-Cas9 to punch your holes. Can that mm -hmm. be done at scale? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, how does that no. work? And, and, and I'm just curious, like, how, if, if you don't mind, if you can, I we know. We did it, we did it. No, 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 that was published. We did Cas9 as well. We used Cas9 and we used PFAGO and we decided oh. to go with PFAGO. No, no, I meant, yeah, I mean, a PFAGO or Cas9, it doesn't matter. I'm saying, huh? can it be done at scale? Like, can you punch holes? I, I mean, the idea is, is, is you have, multiple uh, strands of DNA and you want to punch holes in all of them at, at, at yeah. particular locations, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, uh, you can do it at scale. In a, if in scale means you can do a punching at multiple locations. So what we tried is uh, punching at 10 different locations simultaneously. That's as far as we went. Mm. But because of uh, can, you also do it? Can, can, can you do those 10 punches uh, at the same time on multiple strands? Yeah, 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 yeah. Fully parallel, that you can yeah. do. Yeah, how uh, does that work? Like, like how does like, things like PFAGO work? Uh, if you so, don't mind, yeah. Um, yeah. So the, let me just go back. Oops, wrong way. Oops, sorry. <laughs> um, let me just find it. Uh, when you say how it works, um, let me just find the cast picture, okay? So this, uh, this is the Cas9 enzyme. Uh, the problem with uh, Cas9 is it needs to have what is called a PEM recognition site, a PEM sequence, uh, so that it can attach itself to the location right uh, after P the PEM sequence. That allows you less freedom in terms of where you can punch. So that's one reason why we didn't use it. Okay. If, you, if you ask people in the literature, Cas9 also has undesired side activity. It can make errors. And that's what people that work in DNA editing are a little bit scared because there were some experiments, I believe in China, maybe in other countries where they tried to edit living organisms using Cas9. And that's spooky because sometimes it will do something uncontrolled and cut off a very un, uh, very unrelated location, not the one that it was supposed to do it. So let's say we forget about Cas9. You can see in the paper, we tried it and PFAGO worked better. PFAGO, if you're asking scalability, I'm not sure uh, what scalable could mean, let me explain, but you can have uh, uh, one PFAGO cutting here, one cutting here, one cutting here, and they can do it simultaneously. They can cut whatever they needed to cut in this strand. And if there is another copy of the DNA, they would disassociate, they would leave the site that they just cut and move to something else. They're hard workers. This is what I said. These guys, uh, the PFAGO can cut many, many different strands. So, um, we, we estimated that we could create 100 NICs, probably even more. They will be on different strands, but um, they will cut only if those strands are in the same pool. Mm -hmm. they, cannot, uh, they cannot really move from one pool to another, but that means that you can get large, large volumes of DNA cut at the same location or nicked at the same location. So you're getting a huge amount of DNA that stores, let's say, um, these 10 nicks or whatnot. So in that case, it's scalable because you, you need very small number of uh, uh, PFAGO enzymes. Cas9, as I said, it can do one nick and it's done. So you would have to use a lot of Cas9 enzymes because each enzyme will create one hole and pretty much die. <laughs> so- does, does, does each cutting site require its own customized version of PFAGO? No, it's the same PFAGO, but you will use different guides. And that's a very smart question. Uh, mm -hmm. But the guides are reusable. The guides are super cheap and we can create the guides from the native DNA. <laughs> Got it. So, but the PFAGO, the enzyme stays the same. What you keep changing for the recognition site is the actual guide sequence. That's what I call the guide. Got it, got it. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you. sure, sure, sure.
Oops. Okay. All right. Okay. So um. Yeah, stop sharing. So. Uh, yeah. Okay. So if there's no question, uh, I will stop the recording and uh. Yeah. Yeah, and you can continue to chat after that. Yeah. Okay. Thanks um, so a lot. <laughs> yeah. So let's thank our speaker again. Yeah, so thank we'll you all. Here.